the Anglo-Boer War, as witnessed by Denis Reitz, and written in his book Commando, a Boer War Journal of the Boer War, by Denis Reitz. Chapter 15 A Successful Affair and After I had last seen General De La Rey during our great retreat through the Free State. Since then, he had been busy in the Western Transvaal, raising fresh commandos and infusing a new spirit into the fighting men by ceaseless activity and by the great affection they had for this wonderful old man. Only two days before, he had fallen upon and captured the British convoy that we had seen on fire beyond the berg, and now he had crossed over to this side with 400 men to strike another blow. An English commander, General Clements, was camped round a bend of the mountain about nine miles off, with many troops, wagons and guns, and when Bayers arrived, General De La Rey was quick to seize the opportunity for combined attack. A plan of action was soon arranged. De La Rey, with his horsemen, was to rush the English camp at dawn from the landward side, while we were to return up the pass and make our way along the mountain top under cover, cover of night until we could fire down on the enemy from, from the cliffs. Having completed his dispositions, De La Rey rode away in the dark to find his own men, and soon the whistles blew for us to saddle our horses. General Bayers led us up the road down which we had come an hour or two before. But when we reached the head of the pass, we changed direction, picking our way eastwards along the boulder-strewn crest of the range. We had to lead our animals, for riding was out of the question over the uneven surface, and progress was slow. Towards morning, tired and sleepy, we were halted for an hour to enable De La Rey's guides, who had accompanied us, to reconnoiter. When they returned, they reported that General Clement's camp stood at the base of the mountain and was held by about 500 soldiers. On the cliffs above, close to where we now lay, was a force of equal strength, entrenched behind uh, sangos and breastworks in case of overhead attack. These men were to deal with while De La Rey's men fell upon those below. General Bayers, whatever his faults, was a bold and resourceful leader, and he made immediate preparations for the assault. Ordering all uh, horses to be left behind, he passed word that uh, we were to advance on foot. We knew no drill, so it was difficult to keep alignment in the semi-darkness, but we got ourselves sorted out in some kind of extended order and moved forward in a long ragged front. We of the ACC were on the extreme right at the edge of the cliff, with a drop of four or five or six hundred feet below us. Bayes was with us, and to our left walked the Waterberger, and beyond them, the Soutpansberg men. Before we had gone far, dawn lit the mountain tops, and with it came a fierce rifle fire from the enemy scunches some distance ahead. We had gone without sleep for two days and two nights, so that our spirits were low, and our advance came at once to a halt. Our line fell down behind rocks and whatever shelter was to be had, leaving General Bayers walking alone, his revolver in one hand and a riding switch in the other. 
imploring us to go on. But we hugged our uh, cover against the hail of bullets lashing around us. From where I lay, on the tops of the crags, I could look straight down into the English camp, hundreds of feet below. I could almost have dropped a pebble upon the running soldiers and the white tented streets uh, and uh, the long lines of picketed horses. As I looked down on the plain, from behind a, a jutting uh, shoulder of uh, the mountain came swinging into view a force of mounted men who galloped hard for the English camp. It was General De La Rey timing his attack to synchronize with our own. They closed in, and for a moment it seemed as if they would overwhelm the British. But then the soldiers rushed to their posts, opening heavy fire. The plain became dotted with fallen men and horses, and the attack wavered and broke. The survivors turned towards the shelter of the buttress whence they had come, and in less than ten minutes, the assault was over. The troops facing us on the mountain, mountain now made a mistake. Like ourselves, they were able to look down at the attack, and when they saw our men retire in confusion, they set up loud shouts of triumph. Stung by their cries, our whole force, on some sudden impulse, started to its feet and went pouring forward. There was no stopping us uh, now, and we swept on the shouting and yelling men, dropping freely as we went. Almost before we knew it, we were swarming over the walls, shooting and clubbing in hand-to-hand -hand conflict. It was sharp work. I have a confused recollection, offending bayonet thrusts and firing point-blank into men's faces, then of soldiers running to the rear or putting up their hands, and as we stood panting and excited with, uh, within the barricades, we could scarcely realize that the fight was won. Our losses were severe. On the ground across which we had charged lay a trail of dead and wounded, and yet more by the Schkanzes. In all, we had about 25 men killed and some 70 wounded, and we shot down nearly a hundred of the English, besides taking as many more prisoners. But it was a heavy price to pay for success. Even in this strange affair, in which our men, who had been cowering disorganized behind the rocks, suddenly flung themselves upon a fortified enemy, with a furious desire to silence their shouts of triumph. We had now taken the main defenses, but scattered rifle shots were coming from a nest of granite boulders to the rear. And General Bayers ordered Krauser, uh, commandant of the ACC, to clear the place. Krauser took a dozen of us, and we worked our way forward in short rushes. But he grew impatient and told us to close in more quickly. The, the result was disastrous, for as we rose, a salvo rang out, which brought down four of our men, having fired his parting volley, the soldiers of whom there were only six went running towards the mouth of uh, the ravine, which led down a cleft to the camp below. I hit one of them through the thigh, and Krauser shot another dead, but the rest escaped. We walked back to see the extent of the damage, and it was bad enough. My old schoolfellow, Jan Joubert, son of Pic Joubert, the late commandant general, uh, had a bad chest wound, and the other three men were dead. Two of them were young brothers named uh, Kukumur, 
about 18 and 19 years old, who had been with the ACC since the Free State days. Also went to see the soldier whom I had uh, shot. He had a nasty wound, but he was bandaging it himself the fir with a first aid pad, which they all carried. And he said that he could manage. He was a typical cockney and bore me so little ill will that he brought out a portrait of his wife and children and uh, told me about them. I made him comfortable and left him cheerfully smoking a cigarette. Jan Joubert was badly hurt. A portion of his rifle stock had been blown into his lung, so Krauser asked me to take a water bottle from one of the dead soldiers and go down to the ravine in search of water. I got a flask and went down the slope to the mouth of the gorge. Unknown to us, there was a, a path to the English camp along which, reinforce, uh, re, uh, along which reinforcements were climbing up to, to dislodge us. I saw 20 or 30 soldiers already near the top, standing in a group, not a stone's throw from me, while many more were coming on behind in single file. I fired at once and dropped a man, the remainder disappearing amongst the trees. From here, they opened fire on me, and I, in turn, had to take cover, dodging from rock to rock to get back to Krauser. On hearing my news, he took a number of men, and we ran down just in time to see the path crowded with soldiers. We lost no time in pouring close-range volleys into their midst. In less than a minute, only dead and wounded were left. More than 20 men of the Imperial Yeomanry of London, lying in the space of a few yards. This was the final clearing, and we now had the camp below at our mercy, for we were able to fire into it without any opposition. Soon we could see the occupants retiring with their guns, and we descended the ravine and entered the camp. In passing by the intake of the gorge, I found the soldier whom I had killed, and I was horrified to see my bullet had blown half his head away. The explanation being that during one of our patrols near the warm baths, I had found a few explosive Mauser cartridges at a deserted trading station and had taken them for shooting game. I kept them in a separate pocket in my bandolier, but in my excitement I had rammed one of them into the magazine of my rifle without noticing it. I was distressed at my mistake. But there is not a great deal of difference between killing a man with, a, uh, with an explosive bullet and smashing him with a lidite shell. Although I would not knowingly have used this type of ammunition, I flung the remainder into the brook that ran by, now red with blood of uh, dead men lying in the water. Having sent back for our horses, we hastened down the path into the camp. On my way down the gorge, I found two wounded officers beside the track, one with his thumb shot away and the other with a broken arm. As I came up, I heard one of them remark, Here comes a typical young boor for you. And they asked me whether I understood English. I told them yes. And the man with a thumb said, Then will you tell me why you fellows are continuing the war? Because you are bound to lose. And I replied, Oh well, you see, we're like Mr. Micawber. We are waiting for something to turn up. They burst out laughing and the one said, 
didn't I tell you this is a funny country? And now here's a young, typical uh, young boer quoting Dickens. The camp was filled with supplies of all kinds. And such a smashing of cases and ransacking of tents and wagons had not been seen since we looted the Dundee camp long before. While we were at this, General Bayers came riding up among us in a rage and ordered us to follow the enemy. But we thought otherwise. We considered that the object of the attack was to capture supplies and not soldiers. As soldiers would have to be liberated for want of some way to keep them. And besides, if we went off, we might return to find the camp already looted during our absence. So we attended to the matter in hand. More especially as Delaray's horsemen had recovered from their setback earlier in the morning and could be seen stringing out across the felt towards where Clements and the balance of his troops were withdrawing down the valley in the direction of uh, Pretoria. We told ourselves that we had done our part in the day's work and that they could do the rest. My brother brought my uh, roan and his own two riding horses down the ravine and we took two more horses from the English lines where many stood picketed, searching out saddles and wallets to match, we loaded our caravan with a spoil in the shape of tea, coffee, salt, sugar, food, clothing, books, and other luxuries of which we had long been deprived. Then we followed the other men, who, having taken what they wanted, were riding along the foot of the mountain to the spot below the old wagon pass from which we had started the evening before. Thus ended our share in the fight. The ACC had lost five men and uh, five were wounded. Among the latter was our Commandant Krauser with a bullet in his foot and my Corporal Jan Nagel with his uh, right shoulder blade badly shattered. A French gentleman adventurer, Georges de Gourville, who belonged to us, was also badly wounded. But the worst was Jan Hubert, who was carried down to the English camp with uh, the other serious cases and left there until the British could be asked to send them surgical aid. For we had neither drugs nor doctors. My brother and I had a glorious feast. And then, having gone without rest for 48 hours, we slept the clock round. Next day, such of the dead as had been carried down the mountain by, the friend, by friends or relations were buried in a single large grave that I uh, helped to dig. General Delaray was present, and he addressed us in eloquent words that moved many to tears. For besides being a fighter, he had a fine gift of simple speech. Here we remained for several days, during which time my brother and I enjoyed um, high living after the straight diet of meat and maize on which we had subsisted for so long. We were refitted from head to heel. We carried a Lee Metford rifle apiece in lieu of our discarded mousers, and above all, we were well found in horse flesh. My gentle, loyal, loyal old roan was as flourishing as ever, and I had a fine little chestnut pony, which I had chosen in preference to the larger but less reliable chargers in the English camp. I gave the other horses away in order to reduce our stable to manageable proportions. My brother had the two horses which he had brought with him from the north. One was a toll-free chestnut, 
and the other was the strangest horse I have ever known. Among the Boers, a chestnut horse with a white face and uh, four white stockings is called Tolfri. There being a tradition that in the old days, horses thus marked went through the toll gates free of charge. Now this strange horse. My father had purchased him in the Leidenburg district from a, uh, from a homecoming burger who omitted to tell us that he was possessed of the devil. He indulged in such extraordinary antics that the police at the government lager had declared him insane and christened him Molpert, the mad horse. Sometimes he would allow a single man to walk up and catch him without trouble. But at other times we had to turn out the whole government from the vice president downward to form a cordon around him. He would pretend to be quietly grazing, but as soon as he was completely hemmed in, he would look up in assumed surprise and start to back against the ring, kicking and lashing so furiously that we had to give way when he would go capering off, heels in the air, to crop the grass nearby. If another cordon were made, he would repeat this performance until he left the men helpless between cursing and laughing. The only persons for whom he had any, any respect were my brother Arendt and myself. He was afraid of me because once at Leidenberg camp, after he had uh, twice kicked his way through, I leapt at him from a distance of several feet and flung my arms uh, about his neck. He reared and bucked and tried to bite and roll, but I locked my legs around his so that he could not shake me off. And in the end, I bested him. With my brother, he was tractable because he had doctored him for a badly ulcered back and the Molpert showed his gratitude by obeying him. His reputation had followed him down south and he was quite an institution amongst the commandos. Often, we would hear a warning cry, Look out, here comes Molpert! And the burghers would scatter beyond reach of his heels. Nevertheless, his tricks and pranks were taken good-humouredly, for he had magnificent staying powers, and the men looked upon him with the admiration that born horsemen have for a good animal. And as for Arendt and myself, we uh, had a very soft spot in our hearts for this queer outlaw. Well mounted as we were, my brother and I felt that we could ride anywhere and be ready for anything and we looked forward with interest to the next move. General Delaray, restless as usual, had gone off, leaving us behind with uh, General Bayers. On Dungan's day, uh, it's December 16th, he and uh, the Reverend Mr. Creel held a religious gathering on a neighbouring hill. They invited all to join in piling a cairn of stones like that raised at uh, Par de Kral in 1880 during the First English War. My brother and I thought the proceedings somewhat theatrical and kept away. But so far as I know, the beacon is still standing in testimony of vain hopes. On the following day, General French, the English cavalry leader, was reported to be moving up the Hackbord Valley from Pretoria, and General Bayers marched out to meet him. Near Hackbord, the ACC was ordered to take post in a range of hills skirting the valley to guard our main body against surprise. 
We spent an uneasy night on a rocky crest overlooking the broad moot, as it was called. And at daybreak the next morning, we saw an English force of three or four thousand horsemen approaching. We had strict orders from Bayers to keep out of sight. So Krauser led us into a gorge to hide our horses, after which we climbed up and peered over the rocks to view the enemy advance. The valley here lies four or five miles broad, and the British scouts were strung across it from side to side, their nearest horsemen passing so close beneath us that we could easily have shot them down. We could see General Bayer's men riding to occupy a line of hills farther up the valley. And before long, they were hotly engaged. We had a fine view of the fight, but our interest in the spectacle was dampened by the fact that by now the British were between ourselves and our parent body. So that if General Bayers fell back, we should be left isolated in the rear. And as the gunfire increased and the troops began to mass, we saw our men running for their horses and galloping away. This was not unexpected considering the heavy odds, but nevertheless there went the commando, pursued hotfoot by the English. And yeah, we were stranded, far behind. Krauser decided to recover contact by riding round the left flank of the troops. But we fell foul of so many of their patrols, and we were so often shelled by pom-poms and field guns that we were forced to take refuge in the parallel hills. From here, we could make out our men about six miles off, moving west from the valley. Uh, white puffs of shrapnel breaking over them as they went, and horsemen hard on their heels. Krauser now led us into the broken country, northwest of Johannesburg, Skirvebergen, where a small force like ours could lie in a hiding for a while, and by dark we were well within the region of its tumbled hills. Although the rainy season was overdue, we had thus far experienced only sunny days, but now the weather broke, and for the next six days it rained without ceasing. We sought out a lonely farmhouse, and here we lay over, waiting for the deluge to lift. The farm was deserted, but sheep were straying near, and dry fuel was stacked in the barns. So we fared moderately well. Georges de, de Gourville, the Frenchman, had insisted on accompanying us in spite of his wound, and he nearly died here, my brother and I nursing him through his fever. On the evening of the sixth day, the clouds thinned, and we decided to set out that night in quest of General Bayers. We had no idea where he was. But we counted on finding him sooner or later, so we started off immediately after dark. We rode all night, save for short halts, and towards morning came to a farm where a woman told us that General French was camped close, uh, close by with uh, his columns. She said that the English had given up the chase after Bayers and uh, were on their way back to Pretoria. But had got weather-bound by the rains and were waiting for dry roads before going on. On, hear the, on hearing this, Commandant Krauser, in his impetuous way, rode off with only two other men to look around. And that was the last we ever saw of them. He and his, he and his companions must have ridden straight into the arms of the English, because soon after they left we heard a few distant shots, and then silence. We waited until daylight, after which we decided to go on without him. 
As the heavy mist hung over the felt, we made our way carefully. And it was as well that we did so. For when my brother and I, with another man, turned aside to water our horses at a dam lying off the road, four English troopers came riding out of the fog and let their horses drink about a hundred yards away. We gazed at each other suspiciously in the uncertain light, and then one of the soldiers shouted, Look out! Those men are boers! And pulling round, they galloped away. We dismounted and fired before the mist uh, swallowed them, bringing two to the ground. Riding up, we found one dead and the other rolling in agony. But both their horses had bolted after the others. While we were trying to help the wounded man, the mist lifted somewhat, and a large English camp was outlined close by. We could hear our men splashing over the muddy ground in haste to get away, for they too had caught sight of uh, the camp. Bugles started calling, and we caught glimpses of soldiers scurrying for their horses. So we galloped away, guided by the tracks lying clear across the sodden felt. After a long ride, we caught them, uh, caught up with them, and uh, when the sun broke through a little later and the fog dissolved, we could see some 500 English horsemen coming towards us, but had no difficulty in outpacing them, for in spite of our long night's journey, their heavy troop horses were no match for our hardier and lighter mounts. Krauser, having been captured, we were now leaderless. But with the Boers, each man is practically his own commander, so the loss did not weigh heavily upon us. Having shaken off our pursuers, we rode along westward at our leisure, until in two days' time, we came on General Bayers and his men, camped around the source of the Moy River in the district of Potterstrom. Bayers appointed Corporal Jan Nagel to be our new com commandant. A popular choice, for although a rough and illiterate man, he was well liked. He was still suffering from the wound received in the berg, but had remained in the saddle nevertheless. We passed Christmas Day undisturbed, but next morning an English column came from the direction of Potterstrom, and as there was no object in fighting except on ground of our own choosing, General Bayers gave them the satisfaction of thinking that we were running away. And at dark, we drew off to spend the night near the village of Fentersdor. From here, we moved about at random, seeking for a chance to strike, but no favorable opening presenting itself. We saw the year 1901 in without further incident. <laughs> 